You know, I'm not one to be arrogant. I'm not one to be narcissistic. But this proud immigrant to the United States has allowed himself the indulgence of a little bit of pride. Because I think this episode is one of my best ones yet. I typically do the edit of the main episode before I film these. I've done that this week. And I think this is premium Jimquisition material. Probably some of the best work I've done in months. And I'm being very, very sincere. So, without further ado, let's kick some posterior. GameStop's found itself in the public eye yet again, and as with most of the time when GameStop's in the public eye, it ain't for nothing good. The recent bit of nonsense to emanate from America's premier seller of pre-orders is the so-called Circle of Life, an initiative reported upon by Kotaku in which GameStop demand stores shift a certain number of pre-orders, reward card subscriptions, used games, and game trade-ins. Those are the four pillars of GameStop's business, and heaven help you if you sell too many brand new games at the expense of all that pure profit. Sweet Mula. And it is an expense. According to the report, every new game you sell devalues the four things you're expected to sell. GameStop gives individual stores their own quotas, where a certain percentage of that store's overall transactions must be part of the four pillars. To use Kotaku's example, if your quota is 30% and you do $1,000 worth of business that week, then $300 of that has to come from pre-orders, reward card signups, used games, or trade-ins. Any customers who, for example, rushed to buy their friends freshly stocked launch day copies of Battleborn without also trading anything in, buying another used game, etc, were actively hurting the store in the eyes of GameStop's overlords, and the workers would have been expected to sell even more subscriptions or second-hand releases to make up for that huge Battleborn rush that we all had. Do you remember that? You remember when Battleborn was really pop? <laughs> Bitchford. The end result of this is that employees, terrified by GameStop's mandates, have begun actively lying to customers in order to keep their quotas reasonable. There is no reward in a GameStop clerk doing their job and simply giving you that copy of Neo. In fact, there could be punishment. If they sell it and can't get you to pre-order something else or buy several hundred used copies of Battleborn. Hell, some GameStop employees are frightened to sell new consoles anymore, pretending they're out of stock so they don't take up to a $400 hit on their quotas. Remember, every new product bought ups the amount of used games and other GameStop-only moneymakers that have to be sold. Sweet Mula. If you've never been in a GameStop, and God bless you if you haven't, you lucky fucker, you've likely seen the results of the circle of life, even if they're not quite so dramatic as some of the reports out there. The constant push for pre-orders and subscriptions, I mean, it's overwhelming, and the atmosphere of desperation that soaks into the store walls like the stinker garbage juice on a hot summer's day, I mean, it turned me off ever wanting to visit one of those fluorescent lit shit dungeons again. Plus two of the clerks in one of the local ones were like really, really creepy. I won't say which one it was, but they... Huh. Kotaku states that the Circle of Life program started late last year, but it's existed in other forms long, long before then. A former GameStop manager I know who looks a bit like Dominic Diamond expressed surprise at this only being news now, claiming it to have been standard operating procedure since at least 2002, and claiming it was one of the reasons he quit the position, and I don't blame him. In talking about the situation, he listed some damning results of GameStop's fuck dump of a philosophy. Let's look at that list together. 1. He was forced by his district manager to fire his most valuable employee and best salesperson because despite selling twice as much product as anybody else, his pre-order and Game Informer subscription sales were not up to standard. 2. He once reported his district manager to the regional manager for artificially inflating pre-order numbers by reserving them personally and then shifting the money to new games week on week. In response, the regional manager threatened to fire not the DM, but the former manager for daring to speak of it. Three. Employees were actively encouraged to refuse sale to any customers looking for launch day games who also hadn't pre-ordered anything. In general, the store could allocate less than 10 non-pre-ordered copies of a new game at launch. Basically, if you hadn't pre-ordered it and you turned up, you had to be one of the first 10 people, otherwise you were thirked. 
Grimly, stories like these are not uncommon, falling in line with accounts I've read from other employees, some of whom sent their accounts to me, some of whom sent them to Kotaku, some of whom have just been putting them in comment sections everywhere. A common theme is fear. GameStop keeps its workers in line with a healthy dose of terror, because any business model based on Shinra Incorporated is always great. Unpaid overtime, for example, is not something the company would ever directly enforce or encourage among its workers, but workers have to do it anyway if they're to meet sometimes unreasonable demands, especially given the fact that sales staff exert very little control over the will of customers or the releases of games and can't actually do that much beyond lying, to force the sale of used games onto people. GameStop workers have taken to sharing advice with each other on maintaining their circle of life scores, putting out tactical info and walkthroughs like they're trying to beat a fucking Dark Souls boss. Except you get rewarded and feel like you've progressed when you beat a Dark Souls boss. Here, you just get given a stay of execution. So why is this happening? Well, the way I see it, it's a case of corporations deep-dicking each other and the customers and employees getting jizz in their hair as a result. Until physical media is fully obsolete, the game industry needs GameStop to sell its discs. On the other end of the table, GameStop needs the game industry to have discs to sell. Seems like a straightforward arrangement, except for the bit where both sides really, really, really want to fuck up the other one's business. The game industry takes such a high percentage of the money from new sales that there's almost no benefit to GameStop making them. Reports vary, but commonly I hear it's about two bucks that GameStop makes off a $60 game. Now, GameStop takes all the money from used sales, all of it, so there's literally no benefit to the game industry in the sale of second-hand games. What this means is the primary way in which both these companies are making their money actively fucks the entity they need to make that money in the first place. It's fucking ridiculous. <laughs> like I just... <laughs> I wrote this the other day and I'm reading it now, it's fucking stupid. Right, imagine that Megatron and Starscream were one person, like melded together. Now imagine that there were two of them, two of these Mega Screams, and they had to do business together, simultaneously holding megalomaniacal power and snivelling obedience, both attempting to undermine each other while also maintaining their shared dominion of lawful evil. It's a dramatic way of putting it, I know, but it's sort of representative of the relationship between GameStop and the big budget game industry. Two sad Megatron Starscream hybrids pretending to be friends and wishing the other were dead. It's not a business arrangement that can work without victims, and unlike the economy, bullshit always trickles down. Rather than try and work out some sort of compromise between each other where both parties could benefit more from both new and used sales, the years-long standoff has resulted in the unpleasant atmosphere of the GameStop store. A place of fear and pressure and unchecked growth of pre-order culture. You're an idiot, Starscream! The employees on the ground are the ones that pay for the bullheaded avarice of the executive miles above their heads, and it's the customers that deal with bad service from people encouraged to serve badly and thus be paradoxically good at their service jobs. It is important to note, of course, that not every GameStop is the same and not every employee has it quite so bad. Among the emails I've received from retail workers, one actually defended the circle of life as strict but reasonable, claiming any district managers encouraging dishonesty or using undue pressure to up their quota scores are likely to be fired if caught, and that frontline employees are only fired if their scores track badly for several months. However, even this anonymous defender of the Circle of Life scheme admitted it had been a drain on morale, and went so far as to say much of upper management's decisions are, and I quote, absent-minded and stupid. You're an idiot, Starscream! In any case, reports from people who have not only contacted me but continue to be published by Kotaku paint the picture of a company that's wounded and thrashing for survival. Unfortunately, this is what happens when you have a business model as convoluted, testy, and borderline acrimonious as GameStop's. GameStop is a business that relies on a whole other industry that can't wait for GameStop to die, and that's sure as shit not a business with an infinite lifespan, not as digital sales continue to grow. As we've seen with the love-hate relationship between publishers and retailers, companies will never, ever compromise so long as they can pass the results of their stubbornness onto the customer. Remember online passes? 
I sure as fuck remember online passes. The late 2000s and early 10s saw popular rhetoric among game developers and publishers, demonising used games and those who bought them, blaming the second-hand market for failed releases, and sometimes going so far as to equate it with piracy. Dennis Dyack wouldn't shut his fucking mouth about it. This rhetoric paved the way for the online pass, a nasty little idea in which portions of video games were locked behind one-use codes. It was usually online multiplayer that would get gated, with publishers using the excuse of having to pay for server costs. What the fuck would we pay in PlayStation Plus and Xbox Live for then, you pricks? But sometimes even single-player content would be held to ransom, such as Catwoman stages in Arkham City or a mission sequence in Kingdoms of Amala. Ah, oh, Kingdoms of Amala. Another victim of Bowling Green. Anybody buying these games used would have to pay a $10 toll to the publisher to unlock the full game, often making it more expensive to buy games used than new. This was because the likes of Sony, EA, Warner Brothers, and THQ couldn't and wouldn't find a way to work with GameStop, so they just smeared their oily dicks all over the game buying public instead. Fortunately, the backlash was big enough and the results unsuccessful enough that online passes would eventually disappear. But not before Microsoft tried to turn the Xbox One into a big DRM machine that would allot games to a console and kill the used market altogether. Yeah, some of us haven't forgotten that the Xbox One was originally planned to feature an always online DRM requirement to run games as if it was a giant fucking Ubisoft machine. Some of us haven't forgiven, either. I realise I've turned this whole thing around onto video game publishers again because, well, you know, fuck them. But also fuck GameStop as well, because GameStop is a corporation like video game publishers are and pretty much all corporations are shit and should probably be subject to harsh travel restrictions or something. Not a ban, just restrictions. Not ban. At the very least, I think the CEO of any major corporation should be sent to jail the moment they take the job. It could be a nice jail. Like, they don't have to be in a cell next to death row or anything, and they're allowed to leave as soon as they change jobs. But if they're a CEO, they've probably done something fucked up and should just go straight to the jail, thanks. <laughs> but returning to seriousness, because I was being facetious, of course. GameStop's broken business model and fucked up behaviour should have been called out years ago. And I'm not just criticising the press over that, yours truly should have been railing on this shit long before now. The Circle of Life might be getting coverage now as a new thing, but it's existed for at least eight years in some form or other, and it points to a company that doesn't deserve to be in business. Because you really don't deserve it when you can't run that business without the need to be a self-serving, contemptuous, nasty little cunt. These are the tales of the Skeleton Warriors. Before class is dismissed today, I have a statement I'd like to read. Uh, it's a serious statement as well. This isn't a goof or anything. And if you've been online and followed me around uh, yesterday, over the weekend, whenever, you may have seen this statement already. But I really do want this one out far and wide. So here we go to show you how serious I am. I'm putting on my normal serious boy glasses. Here we are, we're good and serious. And I'm going to just read this out now. <clears throat> As some of you know, the lawsuit against me is continuing. I'm being sued for libel currently. James Remine amended his complaint to comply with the judge's request that he either seek a lawyer to pursue a suit against me on behalf of digital homicide, or amend the lawsuit so it is not about the LLC he tanked by attempting to sue hundreds of anonymous people on the internet. Remine has taken the latter option and continues to not only accuse me of libel, but of directing criminal harassment against him. Such evidence of this alleged direction includes Operation Cleanlight, a program I instated to highlight good games on Steam Greenlight and talk about why I find them appealing. It also includes the Steam Cleaner! A comedic vigilante alter ego in a leather plague doctor mask that I introduced while talking about underhanded cottage markets in Steam's Greenlight community. Keep licking my lips in between paragraphs. <clears throat> That's not part of the statement. It is my personal opinion 
that of those portions of the amended lawsuit we may deem comprehensible, the charges are convoluted and possess such an intense degree of flimsiness, no word currently exists to convey quite how flimsy they are. According to what one can yank from the tangled mess of words and poorly scanned images, James Remind wants $15,326,000. All I'll say to that is this. When this is all over, I will consider reimbursing you the $1 a month you claim to give me on Patreon to prove I do enough business in Arizona to go to Arizona to deal with your fucking lawsuit. Thank God for me. Thank God for me.